Hey, everybody. Um, yes, I'm Susan Peck, who's here, and I are the co-chairs of the program committee, and we've been charged with coming, trying to come up with um, a series of um, these Ask the Expert uh, topics, and also um, we also organize uh, other virtual, this year, virtual presentations and soon to be resumed in person walking tours. So um, we encourage you to follow our um, website and any emails you get from the Conservancy to see what's up, what's coming up next. Um, tonight, uh, we're welcoming Rob Fleming and um, Christopher Sonley, um, a, a team for tonight of um, two landscape architects. Um, Rob is a Chestnut Hill resident and uh, University of Pennsylvania trained um, landscape architect. He uh, has uh, many years of, um, of professional experience as a landscape architect. And although he's no longer in active practice, he's busier than ever contributing his knowledge and experience to various volunteer and, and civic organizations. And he's also actively engaged in the restoration of a large piece of agricultural land in Iowa, which is a very different ecosystem from ours right here, but still some of the principles of how to, how to restore um, a landscape that's been subject to uh, millennia of, <laughs> of human use is uh, it's, that's a problem that's common to many different types of ecosystems. Um, he'll speak first, and then um, Christopher Sonley, um, our second presenter, is a Mount Ariite, but that's okay, we'll let him into Chestnut Hill for this talk, mm -hmm. and a landscape architect um, trained at Temple. He, he co-founded Spruce Hollow Designs, a full-service landscape firm uh, which focuses on environmentally diverse design and, and restoration. And he has also helped us here in Chestnut Hill plant dozens of street trees as part of our uh, Chestnut Hill Tree Tenders group. So thank, thank you both and take it away. Okay, time for me to share. Yes, all right, here we go. Just give me a second to find the program. Okay, can you see it? Yes, for sure you can see it. Gene, okay, great. Well, uh, it's, it's been great uh, getting to know Chris. We met through the uh, Chestnut Hill Green Space uh, Committee. We haven't known each other that long, but it's been uh, great to see his approach to things. Uh, and I look forward to his portion of the uh, presentation tonight. My, Portions by way of introducing him long-windedly uh, and uh, kind of catching you up on a couple of things that are happening at the Conservancy. But anyway, it's, um, it's Earth Day and the screen is not responding. There we go. Um, <clears throat> first Earth Day was 51 years ago today, exactly. You can see the date there on the uh, New York Times. Uh, President Nixon and uh, Pat Nixon are planting a tree. I've been, I was trying to figure out what it looks to me like a larch, which would be appropriate because it used to be a swamp uh, where the White House sits right now. I looked on Google Earth to try to see if uh, I could see if it survived, but I wasn't able to determine that. Um, anyway, uh, there are precursors to the first Earth Day. Uh, I have sort of a Zoom meeting of uh, the giants of American uh, ecology. Um, not all of you may know about John Wesley Powell. He uh, was the first person to navigate the uh, Colorado River through the Grand Canyon. In fact, he did the whole length of the Colorado River. Um, and he was the first uh, uh, director of the department, what became the Department of the Interior, who will feature tonight in the presentation. Uh, he lost his arm in the Civil War um, 
he's notable in American ecological history because he proposed that the West should be organized, property should be organized by watershed, not by the great uh, checkerboard grid. Uh, Congress uh, put that down, the railroad interests opposed that. But he was also a very accomplished ethnologist, which is why he's posing here with uh, Tao Gu, the chief of the Paiutes. In contrast, on the other side, you see John Muir. Uh, he's uh, being dis discredited this day by his own uh, fellow uh, Sierra Club uh, members. He was the founder of the Sierra Club, and he made many racist remarks, in particular about the Indians in the Yosemite Valley. So he's under fire right now. But of course, he's a giant of American uh, 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 environmentalism. Frederick Alms, I think you all know, the father of uh, landscape architecture as we know it. Otto Leopold, you probably most of, most of you know, a hero of all um, people involved in any kind of ecological restoration. And Wallace Stegner, you might not all know, he's my favorite author. He wrote the biography of John Wesley Powell and was very instrumental in keeping the Grand Canyon from being flooded by a dam. And the compromise, uh, which he worked out with the Sierra Club, was Lake Powell behind the, uh, the Glen Canyon Dam. Uh, there was a trade-off. And uh, unfortunately, John Powell would be turning over in his grave if he knew that lake had been named after him. And then, of course, Ian McCarg, our own Ian McCarg, he lived in Chestnut Hill. And uh, my screen is not switching. There we go. Uh, Ian uh, was very active on the first Earth Day 51 years ago. The day before the Earth Day, he read the entirety of uh, the Declaration of Independence in front of Independence Hall. And the next day, uh, led a crowd of people on Belmont Plateau. There was some 30,000 people there. And uh, he famously said during that, uh, why must I be the person who brings all the bad news? And uh, he had already published Design, by Na Design with Nature, and uh, it was a great uh, book promotion for him that day, I think. But here we are 51 years later, uh, and we're celebrating, we really are celebrating Earth Month here. There's all kinds of stuff going on here in Chestnut Hill. And uh, specifically here at the uh, Conservancy, we have just formed up a Conservancy Sustainability Task Force. And there they are. I secretly took screenshots of everybody as our first meeting was going on last Monday. <laughs> it's a great group. Um, I won't go through all their names. I apologize to all of them who are watching for uh, not quite being able to catch everybody at their best, except for Heather. She looks really good in that picture, I think. But um, anyway, we're off and running with this uh, task force. And leading up to the first meeting, we're several months of effort uh, putting together a, a white paper to make an outline, a to-do list for the for the task force when they finally convened. And uh, hats off to Lori for putting this all together. I'll just uh, read the mission to you. Don't ordinarily want to do this during PowerPoints, but I'll read it to you. Using Chestnut Hill as an initial focus, the mission is to inform people's perceptions and actions to inspire a culture of sustainability toward establishing a physically resilient, interconnected, built, and natural environment with emphasis on inspiring a culture of sustainability, a kind of citizenship or civics of sustainability. Now, um, the focus of um, traditionally of the Conservancy's efforts uh, is purview, if you will, is the or the historic uh, resources of Chestnut Hill. And these can be subdivided into these various categories you see here. Uh, and over the years, the uh, Conservancy has identified and cataloged all of these uh, resources. Um, in the white paper, uh, we have a, sense, a set of whereas's, you know, uh, kind of leading up to the let it be resolved that we go forward and uh, try to come up with a plan for here and beyond uh, as to what we will do in terms of sustainability. And I'm just noting in green there that uh, we really, as a historic organization, a certified land trust, uh, an archive, uh, meeting and museum standard, we really have to follow um, standards of practice. In uh, the case of an organization like ours, it's the Secretary of the Interior's standards. And um, 
John Powell's uh, legacy, if you will. Um, there are kind of two main parts to it, the secretary standards for historic properties, which is mainly buildings. And then more recently, the guidelines for the treatment of historical, of uh, cultural landscapes. And Leah has put a link to that on the chat. I encourage you all to read that second one. It, it gives you a whole way of looking at the land. Um, it, it's an eye opener. Um, and it's, it's the work of Charles Birnbaum. Uh, he wrote a whole series of handbooks and position paper over the years and argued, argued, argued and pushed for these to be adopted and collated into uh, these standards. And when you get it, you need to click on each one of these little things here to get the underlying uh, results. It's a kind of a two-step deal. But anyway, I really encourage you to uh, look up that body of work. I refer to it all the time. Now, the treatments uh, divide themselves into four categories, basically, but originally there were seven. And uh, I'm just going to show you, I'm just going to re-add the first three of them because I think they're important. Uh, I think they should still be treatments uh, when you're thinking about uh, historic property. The first one is acquisition. You have to get a hold of a place before you can preserve it, right? And then once you get hold of it, uh, you want to protect it. Um, so that here, as you can see in this map, that may involve putting an easement on it, uh, legally protecting it. Um, also, it may be in trouble at the time. Often it's in trouble at the time you secure it. So you need to stabilize it. Treatment number two, treatment number three, excuse me. And then getting into sort of the main line aspects of the secretary's standards, there's preservation, the main one, maintaining a site uh, that's intact and keeping its historic form going. Uh, and these are familiar places to everyone, I think. Pastorius Park is very notable because it is well preserved and it's being looked at, looked after. Uh, it, can, it, you know, closely resembles the way it was originally built. Now, rehabilitation, uh, the second main treatment is altering or repurposing a site and keeping its character. Uh, Anglecott is a perfect example of that. You know, it was a private residence converted to apartments. It keeps its historic character even to the extent that it's a national landmark, I think, um, not only a part of the historic district, and um, but it has substantial modification in keeping. Uh, same thing with Pastorius Park there. That's a modern concrete treatment to hold the old walls together. So that's not faithful, faithful to the original design, but, but it's in keeping with it. The Morris Arboretum in its entirety is a perfect example of rehabilitation. Uh, roads were added, parking lots, uh, all kinds of new things were added, but all of it very much in keeping with uh, its original intent. And then restoration, that's when you have a place that's historic, that's really gone downhill, but it's not lost. And also that you have some documentation for. So High Hollow, for example, is a current project that just won an award from the Conservancy uh, where it's been returned to its original form, a period in time. This excerpt from the uh, uh, management plan for the Wissahickon, for the Friends of Wissahickon, is in a sense trying to return uh, the Wissahickon to its pre-settlement condition to a period in time. Uh, finally, there's reconstruction. That's when you, you start over. And uh, there isn't an example on Chestnut Hill of this for a building. So I'm showing the graph house. So the first time I saw that place was on a tour with Ed Bacon, who started by describing it as an, a kind of a Disneyland exercise. They didn't approve of, of it. But he said uh, when he first went inside and stood in the recreation of the room where Jefferson uh, signed, uh, penned, Declaration of Independence, he was deeply moved. I, I thought that was very interesting. Uh, passive uh, recreation, reconstruction or passive restoration is a feature of ecological uh, design where you, you let nature correct itself. So that's um, a case of recreating from scratch without human intervention. Now, more recently, the secretary has uh, issued um, a, a clearer message or a clearer set of guidelines about that one category, uh, which is rehabilitation, which is probably the most commonly used treatment. And you see the word sustainability here. Um, 
in case you were wondering what these what the, what an actual treatment looks like, here's a couple of them uh, for green roofs in this case, and site features and water features over here. And um, unlike that thing that I referred you to that I said is kind of a must read for you, I think these are a little bit goofy because it's, it's the treatments breakdown is recommended, not recommended. And they're a little obvious, like it's not recommended to select vegetation for a green roof that will be visible, that will not be visible above the roof or, or paragraph. So, you know, just really obvious stuff. But anyway, that's a, an example of treatments under the secretary standards. Now, um, these and other measures for sustainable uh, restorations or uh, sustainable new buildings, for that matter, there's just bazillions of them uh, listed by um, the, um, uh, the LEADS program, uh, uh, Leadership in Energy and Design, and then the Sustainable Sites in Initiative, which is a newer uh, initiative uh, begun by the American Society of Landscape Architects. It's sort of the outdoor counterpart for a green building, the Green Building Council. Um, our committee will be uh, referring to these, I think, as we go forward our, with our work, the task force. I think we should all uh, be happy that we have a, um, a new and interesting Secretary of the Interior, our patroness, the, uh, not the author, but certainly the um, keeper of the Secretary's standards. And uh, it's good to be able to enjoy uh, these standards that she is the steward of. Um, but I need to reassure you that the new task force uh, will not have its collective uh, attention diverted from the big picture. Um, we'll be focusing on Chestnut Hill to begin with. In our first meeting, um, we uh, came up, uh, two of us offered uh, quotations which were generally accepted by the committee as kind of a basic philosophy to uh, move on from. And uh, again, I just want to reassure you that we're not going to get so tied up in secretary standards that we're not keeping the kind of um, real reason that we want to uh, be sustainable in front of us at all times. I apologize for a second. I lost track of my notes. Um, we will, uh, uh, you know, we're going to keep the big picture in mind, but we're going to try to learn more and, and about uh, from other sources. And this is a source I'm quite sure we'll refer to as we get into our work. Uh, this this particular um, volume four of uh, Contosta and Franklin's Metropolitan Paradise is almost 100% concerned with ecological restoration with a focus obviously on the ways of Hicken and Chestnut Hill itself. Um, she, uh, Carol wrote that particular chapter and she was following these principles and standards, the, uh, the uh, analogous standards that the people in ecological restoration use when they're they're doing their work uh, that's parallel and, and similar to uh, the secretary's standards. Here's uh, the Friends of uh, Louis Hicken, uh, very closely following those standards I just showed you in the previous slide. Uh, John Wesley Powell is pointing towards the fact that in our era, we are following his recommendation that planning be organized, especially ecological planning, be organized by a watershed as opposed to by property boundaries. And we have glimmerings of uh, some ecological restoration going on already here in Chestnut Hill, uh, in both cases by institutions. Um, and kind of the promise or the impetus towards something that I think will be really big if, it, if it's possible. Uh, there's been a lot of work on trying to reintroduce the American chestnut. And of course we live in Chestnut Hill, which was once chiefly a chestnut, American chestnut forest. Uh, it all died out during the 1920s because of a virus brought over from Europe. And uh, there's real hope and new varieties and hybrids and the like 
that this can actually be done. And Chris, in fact, has planted a couple in the at the corner of Springfield Avenue and Lincoln Drive, and he has high hopes uh, for this uh, reintroduction and will be, I think, a participant in it. And they've also um, planted several at Norwood last year. That, that's right. Thank yeah, you. Norwood Court Farm, so. So, um, you know, there, there are these kind of formal uh, guidelines and systems and, and the like um, uh, that you can refer to as, as professionals or as uh, amateurs uh, like we are in the, um, well, we're not amateurs in the committee, I shouldn't say that, but those of us from various backgrounds as we try to find common ground and something to hang our hat on us and uh, accepted practices. There are a number of uh, unofficial guidelines uh, that have come out. And uh, the, these two particular uh, publications are sort of the leading advocates for the new perennial movement. And that's sort of a self-explanatory uh, system, as you can see here in the Netherlands, they call it uh, the, uh, in translation, Oasis, and in Germany, in translation, Habitat. In um, Sweden, they call it Grass Carpet. And uh, it, they, as I say, the uh, pictures are kind of self-explanatory. So um, the, the precursors to that current day movement were uh, William Robinson, the real pioneer of it back in the late 19th century. And his successor and colleague, uh, contemporary, he died the same year. Um, actually, she was born in 36. I'm sorry, that's a typo. Uh, Gertrude Deco, the famous promulgator of the cottage garden movement in England. Um, they were the precursors of the current day uh, perennial, new perennial movement. And finally, and remarkably, uh, there's a, a new and exciting, what I think of as a marriage between science and the lush aesthetic of the new perennialists. And I'm showing me these titles. Chris is gonna talk about this and I, he may disagree with me, but I think that he's a part of this movement uh, of not just pushing for native plants in their own right, but pushing for uh, a, an environment that works, and but it's self-sustainable and it's also beautiful and workable. So I'm just going to show a slide of Chris's work now of... Um, uh, something he did at friends meeting and that will hold the screen while he uh, shares his screen and starts his piece of the presentation. Okay, bear with me a moment while we switch over. I guess you have to unswitch, Robert. Oh yeah, I guess I have to, I have to bow out. Don't I? Okay, here we go. And uh, Okay, am I gone? I think so. Oh, and I need to go to... There we go. Everybody see that? We good? Yep. Excellent. All right, well, thank you everyone for joining us. Uh, I'm very honored to be here with Robert and with everyone in the Chestnut Hill community. Uh, I'm going to talk about how to increase the value of your garden. Robert's kind of talked about the big uh, picture and I'm gonna to try to bring it down to a little bit more uh, your backyard kind of framework. And I'm gonna talk about three basic ideas here, three steps uh, that I suggest and that is assess prioritize and plant and maintain how to do that in your garden. And I think that my video went back. I don't know how to go back. Anyway, so whether you're new in your home or you've been living there for many years, um, there are ways that you can increase the environmental value and the aesthetic value of your property. And just to narrow down the framework a little bit, my discussion is intended for residential gardens. Uh, the ideas that I'm talking about can certainly be applied to public gardens, pocket parks, et cetera, 
but my focus is residential gardens for tonight. My slide will advance. There we go. So let's start with assess and where to begin with your landscape. So your garden, I always view it as it's kind of that magic place between your private home and the public sphere. And gardens, individual residential gardens are kind of a magic area. It's somewhere where you can be you, where you can be creative. Uh, you can plant your favorite flowers. You can have your little patio or your fire pit or you're playing, uh, you know, with your children or whatever it might be. And so to me, it's very important to look at that landscape and think about what it means to you in the process. So first step would be to take a good look around your yard and your landscape and see what stands out to you. It might be the Japanese maple, which we have so wonderfully in Chestnut Hill. Or maybe you have a spot where you have standing water, or maybe you have something you want to change, something you really love, something you want to enhance. Uh, try to get a good sense of those things. It's funny how we don't notice them sometimes. And often when I do site visits, people will walk me over to one shrub or one tree and they'll say, my daughter planted this in second grade and it's our favorite tree. And so it's important to know that and to think about that. Uh, secondly, think about what you can change and what you can't. Sometimes uh, you might have a, a large tree that's creating a lot of shade and we love our large trees, but maybe the shade is a problem. Sometimes you can get them limbed up or thinned out. Uh, the soil is another challenge that you may have. Maybe it's, you know, really rocky or maybe it's clay and you can do some things to mitigate that. But more importantly, if you kind of know what your soil is and you work with it, that's the one thing that natives are really good at. If you understand what native plants will fit your soil, you can oftentimes choose things and you won't need to do any amendments or changes. And if it's a small space and feels crowded, sometimes you can prune shrubs or even remove shrubs or other things. Uh, if you need more privacy, you can create rooms. If you have a large property, there's things you can do to create more interest. So these are all kind of structural things that you can think about. And thirdly, what do you want to feel in your garden? And I run into this a lot that you, you might be a young couple who have small children. Uh, we just had a client who ripped out a whole native garden and put inside because they have two small children and they need a place to play with the kids. So that's how things go sometimes. Uh, on the other hand, maybe you don't need the basketball net anymore if your son's gone to college and that creates an opening on another part of the property. Uh, this particular example in the photo was a Japanese maple that was hidden with vines and we kind of found it and rediscovered it for the owner. So uh, think about what you want to feel and what you want to try and do in your garden. And, and the trick that I often use is just wave a magic wand. Look around your property and imagine what you'd like it to be, what you'd like to add or take away or change. And you can't, maybe you can't always do that. Maybe you can't do it today. Maybe it'll take some steps to do that. But let yourself just think about that and, and imagine what you can do. And then you can plan and get there eventually. Oops, I clicked on the wrong thing. There we go. So then <clears throat> you want to prioritize. So now you've assessed your garden. You see what you like. You see what's good. You see what works. Then you want to prioritize. And this begins with, I think, expanding your knowledge. And we're so fortunate these days um, to have access to a whole variety of garden classes. There's things at Morris Arboretum. There's things through Penn State. There's wonderful things on the web. Um, and did I lose my video? I don't know if I did or not. OK. Um, and. There's lots of books out there. There's lots of things on the internet. 
and try to kind of educate yourself and find something out there that helps you understand what you want to do and what you might be able to do. Uh, secondly, find people that will work with you. Uh, I, I get these horror stories from people who have landscapers or uh, designers who come in and tell them what they're going to do in their garden. It's your garden and you want it to look the way you want it to look. And just be sure that that's what's happening, whether you're doing it or whether someone else is helping you, remember that it's your garden. Uh, it's a good idea too, to look at things like structural issues. If you have a, a walkway that needs fixing or some steps or porch railing, that's a problem. It's good to correct those things first before you try to do something with your garden. Uh, we've already had to terribly tear out plants because they were redoing a driveway or, you know, they're getting their house, their roof redone, and we've had to cut back plants. So it's something to think about ahead of time. And when you're ready to do something, uh, a horticulturalist or landscape professional can help you find options. Uh, sometimes folks will do consultations and help you figure out how to do it yourself. But explore all your options before you get too, uh, too far into something. And again, most importantly, remember it's your garden. Uh, after everything else you've done, this is your personal space. And you, whatever you do, you want it to reflect you uh, when you're done. And third of all, in the, the priority process is time and money. And what's the bottom line there? You know, do you have the time to do things for your garden? Uh, we work with a lot of folks who are very busy and you don't even have time to do a planting or to do different things. Um, so you might need to find somebody to help you. Maybe you do. And I certainly encourage people to do everything you can in your own garden because it's great fun. Uh, on the other hand, some projects like removing English ivy or getting a tree pruned, you need professionals and you have to think about, you know, can you spend that money? Can you spend that time? So budgeting is an important thing. So, and we get to plant maintain. So we've talked about assessment. We've talked about priorities. Now you're ready to plant and maintain your garden. And what should you do? So this is uh, somebody that I rely on and have for many years. This is Doug Talame. And I don't think I'm sharing my screen right. Um, I don't know. Well, I guess I'm going to just continue. Look, somebody else. Looks good to me. Rob, are we okay? Can you still see me? Yeah. Okay, yep. good. I yeah, can't see good. myself for some reason. So anyway, we'll just continue. <laughs> uh, this was Doug's first book, Bringing Nature Home. Uh, absolutely uh, a game changer for anybody in the natural movement. Doug is a professor of entomology at the University of Delaware. He has been doing research for over 40 years about the interrelationship between native plants and native insects. Uh, there's a lot of people who say, oh, you know, we can have any kind of plants. Well, Doug is absolutely no way. You need native plants to support native insect populations, which are fundamental to our birds, our butterflies, our amphibians, and to us. And I highly recommend anything by Doug. Uh, he now has this wonderful website, Homegrown National Park. There are many video presentations uh, on that website of Doug's. He's, he's a very engaging, wonderful speaker. And just recently, and I want to say these, uh, all these resources will be at the end of my presentation. So I hopefully we can make them available. Uh, there's also a new website called emudata.org. Uh, this is all of Doug's research from the Living Landscape publication. And it's, you can go in and actually look at the entire list of some 350 plants and look at them in different categories to help you choose what's best for butterflies and birds or what might give you more landscape function. So Doug is kind of my touchstone and my inspiration. 
So the basics of native plant design, just to go through some of these really quickly, uh, I want to just be sure these are my guidelines. I'm a landscape designer and you will certainly read other books and other publications and folks may go at it differently. This is from my own experience in the field. Um, so just that little caveat. Um, perennial native plants are frugal. Uh, they do not need fertilizer. They do not need a lot of water. They don't need a lot of mulch. If you're good at growing tomato plants and zinnias and annuals, you might have to re-educate yourself a little bit with natives. Um, natives take a, a pH a lot of times from 6.5 to 5.5, which is really lean soil compared to other plants. Uh, we This garden in the background here, this is Chestnut Hill Friends Meeting. Uh, there's some 2,000 plugs in there and about 40 shrubs. We did absolutely no soil amendment to that. That was just the soil that was in the hillside. No fertilization, nothing. And as you can see, it's thriving. Uh, right plant, right place. This goes back to the assessment that you did of your garden to look at what your garden is like. If you know areas that are dry or wet, whether it's sunny or whether it's shady, that makes it easier for you to know what plants will thrive in your garden. So it's a good idea to get to know, as I said before, get to know your garden, and then you can look for plants in these categories. And going back to the research, you'll find that many of the sites online will make it very easy for you to search, you know, sunny plants or, you know, shady plants, uh, depending on height, depending on bloom time, uh, there's quite a selection of native plants out there. And then you really want to know your plants. When you start to put things in, um, your garden, and, and here's where I might debate with Robert a little bit. This is not a landscape restoration. We can certainly be guided by those ideas. But your garden, we normally think about aesthetics. You need to know that your garden looks good it needs to be legible, it needs to be enjoyable, and it needs to be manageable. And some of our prairie plants are wonderful, like Canada goldenrod, and uh, this is ironweed here in this picture. They're marvelous. They can easily be six to seven feet tall, uh, and they can also be kind of aggressive. So I don't recommend them in a garden. There are other varieties of goldenrod that are more civilized. Uh, that are available out there. So just be careful. Sometimes uh, we had this in the early days of native plant design that people were using prairie mixes and that sort of thing. And we had some very unruly gardens. So if you have a back corner, you want to plant anything, please go for it. But if, if it's just a hill front yard, you might want to just know your plants and use folks that are a little more civilized than some of these. And the other thing we hear a lot now is people want a pollinator garden or they want a bee garden or a bird garden. And that's great to have that, that passion. Uh, but what you wanna try and focus on is to really create habitat. Uh, Doug Tallamy does a great job of talking about this. Uh, rather than just focusing your garden on one particular thing, you wanna think about creating niches for everything. And this little diagram I thought was helpful, and there's the website where it came from. There's lots of those online. Um, in naturalistic gardening, or what they're calling in Germany now, animal-aided design, which I thought was just intriguing. What we try to do is emulate nature. So you strive to have the canopy layer of large trees, a mid-story layer of smaller trees, shrub layer, perennials or herbaceous material and ground covers. So in Chestnut Hill, Mount Airy, Elkins Park, we're very fortunate to have a canopy layer. Mostly we have large trees. Uh, if you have enough room on your property, you can often add a mid-story tree, maybe a redbud or a dogwood, something that's gonna be smaller. Then 
there's always room for shrubs and there's a variety of different shrubs out there. Some that'll, you know, stay at three or four feet, some that'll go to 10 or 12 feet. And that gives you a whole nother niche to work with, a whole nother color in the landscape to try and fill in. And then there's herbaceous plants, perennial plants, and then ground covers. And what uh, the botanists tell me and, the, and uh, Doug and all those folks is if you have all of these niches, then you have a place for birds to nest, for birds to hide, for insects to have their eggs, for them to find food, et cetera, et cetera. So you wanna try and have as many of these layers as you can. And you might not have room in your garden for all of them, but it's just something to think about when you're adding things to the garden. Just briefly, I'm gonna talk about mulch, please, from my own perspective, don't use dyed mulch or rubber mulch. Um, these are artificially created products. Uh, there's a big debate on this and I'm not gonna go into it. Um, do some research on dyed mulch before you use it. I have seen it to be very hard on a landscape and hard on plants. They tend to take a lot of nutrients out of the soil. They create a lot of heat and Honestly, you want plants, you don't want mulch. You don't want a mulch garden, you want a plant garden. So uh, just think about these things a little bit before you use them. One of the alternatives you can use are wood chips. If you have a large bed or maybe a bed that you're trying to deal with, you removed ivy or something like that, you can get raw wood chips. They're a wonderful resource, they're very inexpensive. Uh, this is a treatment that we did at the Van Aventuri house uh, to try to deal with a large area of the garden. And the last word is maintenance. Uh, remember, if you can't get everything done in one year or one season, break it into doable steps. It, it's a lot of times easier to say, okay, let's just, we want to change the whole yard, but let's focus on the front garden this year and we'll do the back garden next year. Or we'll get this tree taken down in the spring and then in the fall, we'll do some planting. You know, try to step it out and do it in a, in a manageable way. And just like your car or your roof or any other aspect of your house, your garden needs a little attention all the time. Try also to remember not to overdo it because you're gonna have to maintain it. And it might be wonderful to have a big complicated garden like this one. We were there every week to maintain this garden. And this is a fairly small backyard. <laughs> it was a bed and breakfast, uh, but you may not want to be out there, you know, two or three hours every week to maintain your garden. Uh, it's much easier to try to keep things under control and you might need to, you know, really think about that in your plan. How much time do you want to spend weeding? How much time do you have to spend weeding? Uh, and can you maintain your garden? So let's see, I think I'm just about done. The last thing I always tell people, the most important thing you can do in your garden is attention. You know, that should be one place. When I sit on my front patio, I don't have my phone. I don't have my earbuds. I'm not looking at the web. You know, just enjoy the garden. See what insects are flying around, what birds are flying around. Watch the sun go down. That's the best thing that you can invest in in your garden. That's when you really appreciate what nature gives us um, and enjoy it. And with that, I thank you. And I will turn it over to questions, which means I need to Stop. Sure. There we go. Um, thank you both. We have um, we do have a couple questions. Um, well, there's just one question in the chat box so far. One. And yeah, I have some myself, but I'll take. Oh, okay. Good. But um, <laughs> so everyone, please just um, you know keep adding some questions to the chat box uh, while we get started on this first one, which is um, from Melissa. How do you remove ivy? organically without using pesticides. Wow, okay. So English ivy is one of our heritage plants in Chestnut Hill. Uh, 
I used to have a classmate from England and I always kidded him that the English, we, we may have lost, the, they lost the war, but they left us English ivy and hedges. Um, I don't know of any organic way to remove English ivy other than by hand. Um, the one thing about English ivy, it, you can pull it out depending on where it is. Uh, with a little bit of work and practice, it kind of peels back like an old carpet if you dig into it. Uh, there are other ways you can string trim it very hard, like literally get what they call monster line or whatever, and just string trim the, the heck out of it very short. Uh, that will get it back and then maybe you can cover it. Um, try cardboard or layers of newspaper um, and a lot of a lot of attention. But the most important thing about English ivy is get it off your trees. Um, it, English ivy isn't bad as a ground cover per se, but try to keep it off your trees and other plants. So I hope that was helpful. Thank you. Um, let's see. Yeah, the, the questions are flowing in. Yay. Uh, <laughs> Catherine asks, is it better to buy plants than seeds or bulbs? The squirrels keep digging up my bulbs. <laughs> yes, they do. Um, I have that same problem. Um, I would say plants. I mean, uh, to start native plants from seed is a little tricky. Uh, I've experimented with it myself. Uh, because they don't germinate like your tomato plants and stuff do. They can take a while to germinate and take a while to mature. Um, so I suggest plants. And a lot of times what I'll say to folks is if you, you know, again, look at your budget and look at your resources. I think it's better off for you to spend um, money and buy three really nice, healthy plants to put in or if you're gonna put in a tree, put in one of a good size or one or two of a shrub, rather than trying to put in 10 or 15 little bitty ones that don't survive. Um, it just seems to be better for, if you're trying to do your landscape, you know, a little bit at a time, I think you're better off with larger subjects. Uh, and with bulbs, if there's a variety of different ways if you Google how to protect bulbs, there's people who plant them in netting and there's things you can dip them in and all kinds of stuff. So um, keep, keep trying. <laughs> um, uh, Carolyn is asking, um, have you seen success with meadows here or are they just a huge amount of work? Both. <laughs> uh, and Rob might be able to do better with this question than me. Um, there are some meadows in Chestnut Hill. Morris Arboretum has one now, and there's one out at Erdenheim. Um, and what we often do, if people want a meadow effect, uh, we do what I call, and I'm doing the air quotes, a meadow-like planting, where we can take plants that um, are from the meadow plant sort of family and and engineer it so that it looks like a meadow, but it's a little more manageable. And then I'll let Rob take this too. Rob, what do you think about meadows? The well, best way to maintain it is to burn it and graze it. There you but go. Obviously that's not feasible in the residential landscape, but, but um, you need to disturb them. Uh, so mowing basically, you know, twice a year. Um, the timing of the mowing is important. Um, and it depends upon you know what's actually growing there, but you don't want to mow down when it's at its best with the flowers. But um, the, the problem is, of course, the uh, woody species come in, birds drop uh, seeds, and uh, if you keep it mowed in a timely way, uh, the woody species will stay at bay. Uh, the hard part about meadows is getting them going in the first place, and they tend to be more or less self-sustaining once they're established. And you're right about seeding. The thing about native seeds is they need to be what the ecologists call scarified. In other words, they have to go through a freeze-thaw cycle 
I hope so the best time to plant native plant seeds is in the fall. So that they go through the freeze thaw thing and then they germinate in the spring. And then you have to wait sometimes as long as three years for them to appear. So you're right about putting plugs in. Somebody else gets them germinated and then you plant them from a pot. And I just want to add that um, I just noticed in the chat, this will be reposted. And at the end of my PowerPoint, I didn't get a chance to go there. I have actually three slides of different resources that you can go to, uh, places to get native plants. One of the places I'll put a plug in for is Collins Nursery, C-O-L-L-I-N-S Nursery. Uh, it's one of the oldest native plant nurseries in the area. It was started by John Collins, who started it actually at Temple University campus uh, in the 90s, and it's still going, and it's a wonderful place. But we have, uh, do some digging and some looking around. There are many native plant, small native plant nurseries right in our area um, that are just wonderful places, so. Um, I have a, a few questions about getting rid of specific plants. I'm, I'm going to group these all at all at once. <laughs> um, <laughs> getting rid of um, Star of Bethlehem, um, gout weed, and uh, Penelia. Almost impossible to all of the above. Um, <laughs> I hate to say it. Uh, Dennis Lucy, who did gardening in, in Chestnut Hill for many, many, many years, used to refer to gout weed as uh, Chestnut Hill's ground cover. Um, gout weed is very difficult to get rid of. Uh, it thrives in moisture. The one thing that we've noticed is if you don't water as much, uh, you can help to kind of slow down the gout weed. Um, the other thing you can do, uh, I guess I'm only talking about gout weed. It's hard to address all of them. I guess we need another talk. But at any rate, gout weed, uh, one thing we've also found is if you mulch with leaves, and that's a wonderful thing, by the way, we, we didn't get time to talk about, is to use your leaves for mulch in the fall. Uh, but we've had good success with using a thick layer of mulch leaves on in a garden where you have gout weed, it tends to retard the growth of the gout weed. Um, but all of those are difficult to get rid of. Penelia is another one, almost impossible to get rid of. Um, and I forget the other one you ask about, but they're all- the tricky. Star of Bethlehem. Star of Bethlehem, yeah, another one, hard to get rid of. You can dig them out if you have just a few maybe in a bed, um, but they, they all give me a, a great, I have plenty of work to do with those particular plants. They are my, per, my, my main support in life. <laughs> <laughs> They're a profit center for you. Yes, they are. <laughs> um, okay, let's see. Um, question from Rosemary. What insects or animals do Japanese maples support? Wow. Japanese beetles. <laughs> there you go, Japanese beetles. Um, off the top of my head, I do not know, but I'll tell you what, if you look in Bringing Nature Home, I was just looking at this while I was waiting for the presentation to start. Um, Doug in the back has a whole list of that stuff. Um, and some of the websites that I list, um, and if you search around, Xerces Society is one that has a lot of specifics about what insects go with what host plants. And that's a whole vast area of research that I'll admit I am not up to date on. I, I put them in and hope for the best. Let's see. Um, Bridget says, last year there was so much rain that many shrubs in my garden had mildew or fungus. How do I avoid that? Um, if so, it's usually not a problem for the plant. Um, a lot of times you'll see mildew and fungus on plants and usually they're okay. Uh, if it's not, even if it, the plant defoliates uh, and loses leaves, a lot of times they'll recover once the weather recovers. 
um, if they're established and they're healthy. Uh, if it looks like the plant is literally dying from the fungus, um, the best thing to do is try uh, Penn State uh, Extension Service. They're really good at knowing how what some of these things are and how to deal with them. Uh, the other thing is that your garden may just be too wet and the plant may be somewhere where it's not getting enough air. Um, and, and the other correlate to this I'll say to you is there are a lot of funguses and diseases now that we never saw before. Um, and it's, it's very difficult. We're, we're fortunate that our climate here in this area is getting more wet rather than more dry. It is in general a good thing, but it presents us with challenges. So, I just have a comment about the Japanese maple question. They're wind pollinated, so um, they're of no benefit to insects. And the seeds are wind distributed, so they're also not uh, edible. This plant that's not native to this area. Uh, it's not that useful as a habitat for, uh, or as a food source, I guess, for um, animals. Um, I think, let's see, we have, I think there's just one more question that hasn't been answered, but this is a very timely one. Okay. Uh, what, what, what should we expect with the lanternfly this summer? Oh, wow. Well, so one thing that I advise with lanternflies, and I, I always post this with all my horticulture friends, is try not to practice anger at them. And try mm -hmm. to remember that they're just an insect who is doing what they've been genetically programmed to do. They are not evil. Um, you don't want to hate them. Um, I know that's kind of hard. I practice that with ticks all the time, and it's even harder with ticks. But the, the general thing that I've heard from lanternflies from uh, Bartlett Tree Service, which is a national research, is a national research uh, entity, um, they feel that the lanternfly is not a tree killer per se. It is very tough on hop vines and grape vines and a few other trees. But for the most part, they're seeing, it looks like it's sort of a ring. They know exactly where it started in Berks County. And they're seeing that the populations are decreasing in the areas where they were higher before. So I'm not sure what we're going to see this year. Um, I would say the cold snaps that we've had may help hold the population back. Uh, we're liable. I think we're in a very active ring yet to see them. Um, but the, the overall prediction is that they're not horribly destructive, even though they're very annoying to see masses of them. They're fortunately a passive feeder. They're a, um, they don't actively take sap out of the tree. They kind of passively do it. So that makes them less destructive than things like the emerald ash borer. Um, but I think we're going to see them. And th the other thing I would say, since I'm sitting here, is be careful what you do spray on them. Um, try to, again, do some research. Go on the Penn State Extension website. Um, there's a lot of homemade things to spray on them that you'll see online or whatever. And they can be extremely toxic to your other plants and trees and to other insects, uh, or even to your children or your dogs or your pets. So just if you do feel the need to treat them, just do a little research and be sure you're using um, a good, safe product. Um, so best of luck with them. They're really pretty. It's, they are pretty. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. It, yeah. Um, OK, maybe we should just, should we just have one? There's one more question that may not have a short answer. So maybe that should be, this should be the last question. Um, this is um, from Catherine. Can you suggest a strategy to 
Oh, yeah. Now, that could be a whole other topic for another talk. So maybe we will have to reschedule for another talk. But yeah, um, Doug Talley talks about that very well in Bringing Nature Home and in some of his talks as well. Uh, the easiest way to start reducing your, your lawn cover is just decide you can often make your beds, existing beds, a little wider. Uh, if you have beds, you know, make them another foot wider or another foot and a half wider or something like that. Or if you have an area, a lot of times uh, you can just put down four or five inches of wood chips and put in shade plants. Um, so it's it, depending on, again, going back to things I was talking about, about, you know, assessing, prioritizing and maintaining uh, is look at your property and, and be sure of one thing that you want it to look the way you want it to look. If we're talking to a Chestnut Hill audience, uh, like we had a property on uh, Graver's Lane that we maintained and it was a summer. It was all new. It's your lawn. Just think about how you want your property to look and experiment. If you have a backyard and you want to, you know, eliminate some of the lawn, go for it. You know, wood chip it, um, string trim it, put down some cardboard, plant over it, uh, or just expand the beds that you have. Hey, uh, well, I, I agree that could be another complete presentation. So we'll, we'll bear that in mind. <laughs> um, maybe some, maybe when we can gather in person, it could be an in-person presentation. Yeah. yeah. So, so all right. Thank everybody for all the questions and thank uh, Chestnut Hill Community Association and the Conservancy for having us. Uh, it's been a great opportunity. And uh, happy Earth Day, everybody. What a great place to be. Happy Earth Day. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Jean, for leading this uh, Q&A and, and to Jean and Susan for pulling this lecture series together. And thank you also to Rob and Chris for your wonderful talk tonight. Very interesting and very timely. I'm doing a lot of things wrong in my own backyard, and I'm going to try and mend <laughs> my ways but i appreciate your uh your advice here and i feel like we're off to a, a great start so well happy earth day everybody and and have a wonderful evening thank you very much thank you, thank you. good night thank you it was great Bye -bye. Bye -bye.